Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. If you're high achieving, probably specialized professional, delivering your knowledge and expertise as an employee, you are used to solving complex problems and you're expected to solve complex problems. You're also, as an employee, you tend to be judged harshly if you make mistakes more than maybe 10% of the time. And as, as an entrepreneur, actually the inverse is true. So the, the simpler the problem that you can solve, the more profitable it's likely to be for you, assuming that there's, there's a need in the marketplace. And as an entrepreneur, if you are right more than 10% of the time, you're probably doing really well. Hi there, Innovator. It's really great to be back again with you and with another episode of the Innova Buzz podcast. And I hope you've had an absolutely awesome week to date. I trust you enjoyed my recent conversations with Justin Blackman, the brand ventriloquist, and with Jason Van Orden, business and marketing strategist. I'm really excited to welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, David Schreiner Khan of Smashing the Plateau, where he works with entrepreneurs to help them build consistent, stable, recurring revenue with the service that they provide. David was a really early adopter of podcasting, launching the Smashing the Plateau podcast way back in 2014, and it has now reached well over 500 episodes. He's also host of the Going Solo podcast, which is a more recent addition to his podcasting portfolio. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, that's InnovaBiz, where we help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal client. That requires absolute clarity about who your ideal clients are and how you can help them. To help you get that clarity about your ideal client, take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, where... In less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity on your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. Access the Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion, David talked to me about the trifecta of what you love to do, what you excel at, and who you serve that needs your service. These three things to identify your area that you should focus on. He also explained the value of peer support groups to test ideas, to get help, and to generate leads. And he shared with us some lessons from over 500 episodes of the Smashing the Plateau podcast. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from David Schreiner Khan. Hi, I'm your host Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today, all the way from New York in the USA, David Schreiner Khan of Smashing the Plateau where he helps business owners take their meaningful work and create consistent recurring revenue from that. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, David. It's a real privilege to have you here as my guest. Oh, it's my honor, Jürgen. Thank you for inviting me. Mark Helpert introduced us. Mark was on episode 258 of the Innova Buzz podcast, and he suggested we have a conversation with you, David. So a big hello to Mark. Yeah, I'm grateful that Mark introduced us. David, You are also host of two podcasts that I know of, at least, maybe there's more, but uh, certainly your signature podcast is Smashing the Plateau, which you've been doing for 
nearly six years, I think. And then recently, a new one, the Going Solo podcast. And your mission with both of those and with the work you do is basically helping entrepreneurs build that consistent, stable, recurring revenue. So I'm really looking forward to digging into all those things with you today. But before we get started on podcasting and business growth and recurring revenue, give us a little bit of a snapshot of your own background and how you got to where you are today. Uh, sure. So uh, I spent uh, the first 28 years of my my professional career as an employee and the last 14 years as an entrepreneur. And as part of that mix, um, I've had sort of two major careers as an employee and as an entrepreneur. It's probably at this point, hundreds of careers because entrepreneurship is, uh, it's like you're constantly pivoting, but, um, you know, so maybe like you could say it's, it's sort of three buckets, um, two, two major careers as a, as an employee, one as, you know, and then being an entrepreneur and as part of the mix, also three job losses, um, which, which is actually part of kind of my why, like why, why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and who I'm serving as an entrepreneur. Um, and then, and, you know, just, you know, to provide a, a little bit of detail as an employee, uh, I started off as an engineer. I studied chemical engineering. I have a master's from Cornell and, uh, and worked as an engineer for about uh, four or five years. And then I went into the not-for-profit space here in America and spent the next, I guess it was a little over 20 years in uh, leadership and management roles in the not-for-profit space. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating. I'd, I'd forgotten that I'd uh, stumbled upon that, that you were a chemical engineer. So my background's actually in chemistry as well. But uh, I know, you know, you um, went through those um, corporate journeys and, and then you ended up uh, starting your own business. And when when you started your own business, when did you get into the podcasting along the business journey? Was that early on or did you do a whole lot of things before you discovered podcasting? So I started my I started my business in 2006 and launched my first podcast in 2014. So so there was, actually there was it was a while before I launched the podcast. Hmm. Now smashing the plateau, you've got over 500 episodes there, which is pretty um, very consistent. You have you been doing two a week since the beginning? Um, so we started off doing one a week. And then one of the things that I realized, like I had no idea how, how it was going to work and whether I was even going to like it or whether I'd be good mm -hmm. at it. Um, I was actually quite anxious about, you know, I, I had never kind of put myself out there like, like you do when you're creating content, particularly when you're creating content that is either audio or video. It's, it's different than personally. I think it feels different than, than um, putting something out there in writing so I didn't know what it was going to be like. What I discovered was I kind of liked doing it. And I think I was good enough that I wanted to keep doing it. And I also, I thought it was going to be hard to get good quality guests. And I discovered that we were getting introductions to really great guests very early on. And people who wanted to be on the show that I really wanted to feature at a rate that we couldn't really accommodate doing one, one episode per week. Um, and as soon as we, and also this is maybe as part of my engineering background, I'm like a big systems person. I always think about how do I, how do I do something systematically? How do I make it as efficient as possible? So pretty early on, I started creating our own process and started to automate what I could and realized that, that I thought I could handle more volume. And uh, then we doubled it after, I don't know, probably three months or so. So we were producing two episodes a week on Smashing the Plateau for a long time. Um, it got to the point where I think we were in the four, maybe the 400s or maybe early 400s. It was like the end of uh, 2018. And at that point, I, I decided um, maybe we should scale back to one episode per week. At that point, you know, there was an explosion of people doing doing podcasts, um, 2014, I think there was something like a 10th, the number that there are now. And, um, hmm. uh, you know, by the end of 2018, there were a lot of shows in the same space. Most of, most of the shows seemed to be on a once a week cycle. And I thought that 
you know, one of the benefits of being a podcast host is the relationships you develop with the guests. So you, you probably realize that as a podcast host as mm -hmm. well. And I think, um, you know, I've heard this from so many other podcasters that that uh, those relationships are really, really important. And, and in business and life, relationships are, are like the key to everything. And I wasn't, there were so many people that I'd had on that I just didn't have the bandwidth to keep in touch with. I thought, let me spend more time trying to interact with people that had been guests rather than just taking on new ones. And maybe I could, it would be a better use of my time. So I thought, okay, we'll, we'll scale back to one a week and one a week is you know, certainly, certainly good. And we're still producing consistent content. Um, so lo and behold, like two months into um, 2019, when we were producing one episode per week, uh, I got sort of, talked into thinking about starting a second <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah. And I, and it was a good idea. I really liked the idea, so I started to pursue it and then of course I launched the second podcast. So now we're producing one episode per week in each, each show. So in terms of the volume, we're back up to two exactly. two episodes right, a week. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll talk about your second podcast in a moment, but I'm curious um so tell us a little bit about the processes that you did automate when you were, you know, scaling up the Smashing the Plateau podcast? Uh, so one thing that we automated is the, the the booking process with guests, as an example. Uh, in the beginning, we would have a lot of back and forth to figure out when would be a good time to actually record an episode. And um, that involved, often it was me, the guest, my assistant, and occasionally it was another team member as well, and it was really complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so not only did we, uh, like I had to figure out for myself what kind of calendar system would work well for me personally and how I would manage the times that I wanted to um, to book episodes. I, I discovered, actually thanks to John Lee Dumas, I came up, you know, I heard about it, the way he does his episodes, that he batches his recordings. And I thought, oh, that that's a good idea to try to do them all on the same day. And I started to um, to batch my time. So that was the first thing that I uh, really, really helped because what I did was I picked one day per week that was my podcast recording day. And I didn't have to do it every single week because if you think, you know, do the math, if we're trying mm -hmm. to record eight episodes or maybe nine episodes a month and um and you can handle let's say you can handle four or five episodes in one shot in one day you really you need like two days a month to record uh and i've recorded as many as probably six in a day beyond that i sort of um it gets tough to keep up the right level of energy yeah, yeah. after about six um, uh, that's pretty impressive. I, I think my record's been five a day. <laughs> uh, that's, that's still a lot to actually be hmm. focused and, and actively that's listening right. yeah. and have, have the energy up. So, so that was like one thing. And then I was looking at what information we needed from the guests and how the guests would sign up. Um, so we started to use, once I identified my time, we chose a, a calendar system that would, that the guests could use to just book the episode. And five years ago, not that many podcast hosts were using these. They were just starting to. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I saw what, uh, what some others were doing and I thought, oh, that's a good idea. So we chose a calendar system and then I started to make sure that whatever information we needed from the guests, we would get as part of the booking form. And in addition, all the information the guests would need in order to be prepared themselves they would have before they even filled out the booking form. So we've, and we've constantly fine tuned this. So we have two things we send anybody that we approve to be a guest. One is there's a web page that they can access that shows the interview flow and everything they need to do to be well prepared. Um, and then the second thing is the, the booking link opens up a form and it asks for all the information that I need in order to do my research on the guest ahead of time and um, conduct a coherent and meaningful conversation. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really good way to do it. Um, all right. Now, tell us a little bit about why you then started going solo, the, the new podcast last year. So 
and I took a look, you know, I'm always taking a look at, at, um, my audience, both, uh, for the podcast and also clients to see what is it that they have in common that, uh, where I can help them and that our business can help them. Uh, who are they? What, uh, what keeps them awake at night? And one of the, one of the things that I saw as a pattern that many, many of them are solopreneurs. Many of them have deep expertise in their subject area. And, um, and I also noticed that there were, there were also many that started their career as an employee. They were in some kind of corporate environment. And then at some point they made the shift to become entre entrepreneurs. I had the, the sense, you know, not everybody talks about this and a lot of people actually don't because of, um, you know, shame and, um, and fear and all kinds of other reasons. Many people don't talk about the fact that the trigger that caused them to go from being an employee to an entrepreneur was um, a job loss that wasn't their decision. So I sent out, and I was thinking about this, and, and you know, that's, that's also my story. And you know, as I mentioned to you in, in the beginning, I've had three job losses in my life, and each job loss was traumatic at the time, Yet the the actual outcome was put me in a much better place every single time, and you know I, I had to work hard to 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 get that trans get through the transition and to get to a better place, but in the end it actually freed me from some of the baggage that I was dealing with in the previous the previous situation. So I, I had the hunch that a lot of these folks have made the transition because of a job loss. And I, you know, started talking to people about it and then decided I'd send an email out to our list to get some reaction and see whether launching this other podcast might be a good idea. And I was actually overwhelmed with the response. Um, that that email got the largest open rate of anything that we've sent. Wow. And, <laughs> and, and I asked people if they wanted to speak to me about their experience. And I had um, literally dozens and dozens of people signing up for um, for a few minutes to speak with me about it. I'm like, oh, I guess I guess there's something here. Um, mm -hmm. I really I really do want to start this podcast. And the more I talk to people about the idea of the podcast, the more people said to me, you know, that there, there's a need. People are not talking about this. So that's that's how I started it. Mm. So what what kind of information do you provide on on that podcast? Um. There, there are a few different things we provide. One is we share the stories of people who either are going through this transition themselves, who are kind of in the early stages of their their work as an entrepreneur, um, following many years of employment, or um, some people that are a little further along and they can talk about, again, their story. And while it may have been traumatic and seemed rough at the point when they made the transition, they're in a much better place now. And, and then they talk about how they did it. So, that, you know, so it, it, these are examples of um, if, if you're going through a situation where you have recently lost your job and you want to do something as an entrepreneur, uh, and the, there are a lot of new skills you need to learn because we may be really good at delivering great results to our employer or to, um, to the employer's customers, that doesn't mean that we have the skills to run our own business. Um, so there are a lot of skills that, that folks need to learn. And um, by featuring these stories, people are able to hear a little bit about what others went through and how they figured out what they needed to learn, how they learned it. They'll learn some strategies and tactics themselves. The other thing we feature is for, for people that are in the kind of helping roles or advisory space that work with people in transition, uh, some of the trends they see and some of the strategies that they suggest to folks going through this. So we've had some career counselors on. Uh, we've had a therapist on who's talked about trauma. We've had um, an employment lawyer who's talked about how you can benefit by having a, an employment attorney on your side when you're going through this and your employer doesn't have to know that you have an employment attorney that you've hired, but it can be really helpful just to have somebody who knows what the rules are, who's your advocate, who can mm -hmm. help you. Yeah, so people like that, that that can also 
provide some uh, some pointers that can be really beneficial, particularly when you're right in the in the thick of the transition. Yeah, yeah. Well, that I think that's a wonderful service. I know thinking back to my time when, um, you know, I've had the, this experience once. And um, whilst I, I wouldn't say it was traumatic for me because I did have choices, but the choices were such that, you know, they weren't, they were making it very un, unattractive. So it was essentially kind of a no brainer for me to then say, well, I've got to go and find something else and, and made the decision to start up my own business and of course when you do that and you leave the corporate world where you've got people to support you in all kinds of different roles so for example if it's you know if it's a hr issue there's a hr department you can go to if it's a marketing thing you've got a marketing department to go to if it's an it thing you've got an it department you can go to for support now all of a sudden you've got to deal with all those things yourself and suddenly yeah, guess you find, what jürgen you, you you are all those departments that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And suddenly you find, oh, gee, I didn't know this was so difficult. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Yeah. So when you started the podcast, how did you go about promoting it and getting getting traction with it? I mean, obviously you had, um, you know, you, you did a lot of um, canvassing beforehand and you had a lot of interest there. How did you go about getting traction, for example, with bringing guests on for that that, that were... Um, specific to that target audience um you, you, well it was different for each each show um partly based on when we started it and uh, and partly because of the profile of our ideal guest so for smashing the plateau there were way fewer podcasts and and it was um i would say it was more novel to be invited to be a guest on a podcast so there's nothing people like more than to talk about themselves. So if you're giving them an easy way to talk about themselves for half an hour, most people will say yes. Hmm. We would ask people that had been guests for introductions to other people they thought might be guests. So we basically did um, kind of word of mouth referrals for new guests and that it worked just fine. Hmm. So that was okay. for smashing the plateau, and for going yeah. solo, it, it's a narrower focus. I'm looking for mm. for people that um, that ha have a have had a specific experience, and again, we're using word of mouth referrals for the most part. Uh, but I would say that um, we there are fewer people that that fit that profile, and it's. Um, there aren't as many people that are in the pool at the moment. Hmm. Yeah. All right. So if anybody listens to this and wants to be a guest and fits our profile, please let me yeah, know. Yeah. I'd, lo I'd yeah, love to I'll, talk to you. We'll put a link to your um, intake form on the show notes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, David. Um, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about selling your knowledge. So somebody's started their own business they've gone solo they've got some very specialized knowledge and lots of experience in that area i mean what are some of the challenges to start with and how do you then focus in on doing something new that you really love and getting paid what that's actually worth right well one of the biggest challenges is figuring out where to get started hmm. um, particularly if you're high achieving, probably specialized uh, professional selling um, or de delivering your knowledge and expertise as an employee, you are used to solving complex problems and you're expected to solve complex problems. You're also, as an employee, you tend to be judged harshly if you make mistakes more than maybe 10% of the time. Hmm. And as, as an entrepreneur, actually the inverse is true. So the, the simpler the problem that you can solve, the more profitable it's likely to be for you, assuming that there's, there's a need in the marketplace. And as an entrepreneur, if you are right more than 10% of the time, you're probably doing really well. Yeah. And that, th those two factors alone are huge mindset shifts that people have to, have to go through and figuring that out while um, especially if you are um, dealing with the trauma of the job loss, 
and you are full of fear, fear of failure, fear, fear of losing what you've already attained in your life, fear of losing assets. Some people fear because they, all of a sudden the paycheck has stopped. Um, in order to maintain their lifestyle, they may need to dip into savings, which is a pretty scary thing if you've never had to, had to do that. So one of the things I, I tell people is if you can at all, take a breather. If you can, quote unquote, take time off, do it. And there are a few different ways you can take time off. One is if you have the financial resources to actually not focus on generating income for even if it's for a few months, if you can do it for for longer. And I'm thinking about, you know, maybe somebody who's like 50 or 55 years old who has worked for probably 25 to 30 years. If you can take a breather for six to 12 months, so you can actually be sufficiently removed emotionally from the trigger that caused you to be where you are now, you'll make a better decision. But, it, but it, again, you have to have the financial resources and you have to have the kind of the self-confidence that you can, you, you can deal with that buffer. If you can't do that and you don't have the financial resources to do it, another way to do it is to take an interim position, which may not be something you want to do long term, or maybe you don't really want to do it very long at all, but you know you can get paid for it. And it's not going to take a huge amount of brain power to do the work. Um, so contract work or you know, there, there are a lot of places where you can you can do something interim, or even if you're you're able to take another job, you're not going to get paid what you were getting paid before. And either make a deal with the employer, or if you can't say this to the employer, make a deal with yourself. I'm going to give myself a time limit to do this. And by the end of 12 months, I'm going to be ready with a plan to do something else and I'm going to quit. Hmm. Right. Which will give you again that the, the time letting that time go is sort of like if you think about the grieving process we deal differently with grief a year after a loss than we do a week after a loss so if you can and and a job loss is a loss and you know mm -hmm. our whole identity particularly in the western world for for knowledge workers our identity is connected to our work so if you can give yourself that space to be able to not really worry about it for a period of time and start to do some homework and a little bit of research, you'll be much better off. So that, that's actually step one. It's a, it's a big step. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really good advice. And also, you know, having that space to, to then think and plan and do a little bit of research without the pressure of generating that income that to keep going is, is probably going to result in, a much more thorough thought process around what what it is you're going to be doing longer term. Exactly. And then the second thing is once you get beyond that, you need to decide what you really want based on three primary factors, which are what's your what what do you love to do most? What are you most competent at doing? And whom do you want to serve and what do they need? Hmm. And and your ideal offering is some intersection of those um, those three elements. Whom do you love? Wh what is it you love to do most? What are you most competent at doing? And whom do you most want to serve? When what do they need? Yeah, yeah, that's really good. I can imagine as an engineer, um, a, th a three dimensional graph there. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's like you have, you have these circles and then there's yeah. an intersection and you, what yeah. you want to do is find the intersection. Now, answering those questions, particularly if you feel like you've been boxed in for 30 years or 20 years, or whatever it is, um, answering those questions is actually not so simple. And mm. it's really hard to do objectively on your own. That's the place where people would really benefit by getting some help. And there are lots of ways you can get help. You can get help for free by just asking people that are impartial, that know, know enough about you and your field and, and kind of the world of business that they can ask 
um, ask good questions. They need to be good listeners. You can, um, you can hire people to help you. I mean, that's obviously some of the work that we do, but you can, you can hire people. Uh, you can be part of a peer support group. Peer support groups are really great for this because you get, um, you can get a breadth of, um, of different kinds of questions from different perspectives. You'll hear shared experiences from other people who may have gone through something similar, but I would encourage people to find ways to get those questions answered where they're not answering them in a vacuum. Cause otherwise mm. you're probably going to just go in circles and not find that, not have the circles where you, you find that the ideal intersection. Mm. Yeah. And there's a couple of really good suggestions there, particularly for those that are just starting out and that may be a little worried about spending money The the peer support group. I like the peer support group because it actually gives you an opportunity to contribute to others as well. Exactly. Because exactly. I'm guessing there'll be others that will be going through the same process and you can then have input to them. And in, in giving advice to others, you often learn about yourself as well. Yeah. And the next step is once you've, once you've identified something that you have, you're basically, you're coming up with a hypothesis of um, something that you're thinking about testing in the marketplace. Next step is make a short list of your relationships, people that you believe can help you uh, find some leads and people that you think will want to help you find some leads and make appointments, see them face to face if you can and ask them for help. Say, I'm, I'm looking like, you know, in, in my case, one of the things we do is we run these peer support groups. So I'm usually looking for candidates for certain kinds of groups. And I would go to people that know me well and trust the kind of work that we do. And I'll say, I'm looking for a consultant who's been in business for one to five years, who knows there's a product market fit and wants to increase revenue, decrease the amount of time they're spending in their business and make fewer mistakes along the way and would, and they're a collaborative kind of person hmm. and just say, whom do you know who fits that profile? Right. Yeah. So you, you need to come up with a profile of, of what it is, who you're looking to meet because you think they may be a lead for business. But the first step is figure out who your potential referral sources are from your existing relationships and take the time to meet with them take them out to breakfast or lunch or dinner or coffee or whatever, ask them how they're doing, how you can help them and say, would you be able to help me? This is what I'm looking for. This is where I am. This is what I'm looking for. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. I love that. And I love that you're very clear on, well, who are the referral sources, but also what is it you're asking in terms of the profile of, essentially who your ideal client is for that particular service. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. And the clearer you are and the narrower you are in your, your profile of what you're looking for, the easier it will be for them to help you. And, and this is a little counterintuitive for people that haven't done a lot of marketing before the narrower your profile, mm. the easier it is for somebody to make a referral. So if, if I say, um, you know, like in that profile that I just gave you, if I say, I'm looking for someone who is a digital marketing consultant who's been in business for one to five years and works with, and, and that person's clients are companies that are growing quickly and are between 10 and $50 million a year in revenue. That's pretty specific. Hmm. So if somebody knows somebody like that, they're more likely to make a referral than if I just say, I'm looking for a consultant can you refer somebody? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about focus. Um, and you know, this just sort of prompted this question, what you've just said and the counterintuitive nature of that, because a lot of people come out of, um, their corporate career, you know, in, in the later stages of their career, and they've done a whole range of different things. They've built up experience and expertise in so many different areas and they, start because there's this idea of oh, I've got to get business I've got to quickly get some business on board and start earning money again and so they're a little scattergun because they say well I can do that and I can do this and I can do that 
Um, so tell us a little bit, how do you overcome that and get really specific and focused? Uh, I do your market research, ask when you, when you think you can do three or four or five or, or a dozen different things, think about who might need those things and see if you can find those people and ask them about their needs. Hmm. And, um, it, it's basic market research hmm. and you will start to learn who actually needs what it is you think you can offer. And you will also find out who's willing to pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that certainly is a very important point. And I wanted to go on to the idea of, you know, recurring revenue, which is one of your big, um, big points. And so what, what are some things, what are your tips for taking a business that let's say you've, you've gotten into this business, you've found that sweet spot, you've got something that you're doing. How do you get out of that? Um, you know, making a pitch, doing your marketing, then landing a couple of projects, doing those projects and ignoring the marketing for a period of time, then completing the projects, getting paid. And then all of a sudden, oh, I've got to do some more marketing because the money stopped coming in. How do you get out of that cycle and build in that recurring revenue? So first I ask myself when I'm thinking about a, a potential target, rather than what's a problem that that, that prospect has, I think I say to myself, what's an ongoing problem that that prospect has hmm. that they, that they can't solve without help and that they really, um, that that's, that's painful for them and they really want to solve. And if they can solve it, there will be, a, they can solve it and they, and they pay for, for the solution. There'll be a return on the investment. So I'm looking, essentially, I'm looking for a recurring problem and my pitch to the, to the potential client will be, how can we start solving this recurring problem? It's not, how, it's not how do we solve the problem, it's how do we start solving it? Because again, a recurring problem is always gonna be there. So if you think about, um, if you're uh, someone who deals with uh, leadership development around culture in companies, there are always cultural issues. And it's way easier to spot the cultural problems for somebody who is not an employee, somebody who's from the outside. Mm. Like the, the whole definition of culture is it's the way we do business here. So people that are inside and doing business that way almost don't see it. Yeah. Right. And somebody from the outside walks in the first day, they say, that's how you do that. That's a little odd. Mm. Right. So, so and people come in and out of companies. So the culture is always evolving based on who's in the room. And so there's always a need to address cultural issues. So that's, you know, that if you think about that, you could, you could make a pitch for some kind of ongoing interaction that will address cult, some kind of cultural issue in a company, just as an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. It's a, it's a slightly different mindset, isn't it? It's um, looking at, um, long-term problems and looking at pitching that as um, an ongoing relationship. And you talked about relationships earlier rather than a project with a start and an, an end point. Right. I'd rather have a client that pays me a modest amount every month and has access to me whenever they, whenever they need me rather than have to constantly pitch projects, negotiate, sign a deal, do the project, it wraps up, then I have to go out and mm. find a new client. Yeah. Um, but much better to have ongoing relationships. Think about somebody who's an accountant who prepares taxes. People, it's a, it's a recurring need. People have to file mm. taxes, especially businesses. There are, it's, it's not just income tax once a year. There are, there's payroll tax and there's sales tax. And it, like there's always, there's ongoing tax work for uh, and there are various other kinds of ongoing work that's that's uh, regular for for a business client for a for an accountant. So why not set up a relationship where th there's an expected range of business that you're going to cover, and you're charging a monthly fee that you may you may evaluate the fee once a year and adjust it based on um, either the workload that that has taken place over the past year or inflation. But um, but you don't have to go out and renegotiate. You don't have to worry about 
hourly billing where you're always trading time for money and you have, you know what your revenue is going to be. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, it's a different approach to the traditional way of doing business, but I think there's a lot of power in that. And, and it certainly smooths out those ups and downs of, you know, focus on project work and then shift the focus to getting a new client. And then of course there's a risk of, um, that may take a longer time than, than continuity of income actually would require. So the recurring revenue model is, is a much better way to do it. Yeah. Hmm. All right, David, this has uh, been a fascinating conversation. We've learned a lot around uh, podcasting and recurring revenue and kind of transitioning into a, in a entrepreneur's role from from corporate world. Um, I could go on asking lots more questions around various things, but I think it's a good point to move on to our innovation round and we'll point people to more resources um, later on that they can follow up with you some more. So our innovation round is designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions that I'll ask and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers today that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result. So you up for it? I'm up for it. Great. So what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Um. Frankly, I think being in a peer support group can really help because you can, um, you'll hear shared experiences and you can apply how someone else has solved a similar kind of problem for a different audience. Um, and I find that is often how innovation happens. Hmm. Yeah, that that's always a good one to to look at things outside your own sphere and, and see what you can learn from that and what can be implied inside your, um, your particular field. Great. Um, so what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Uh, for me, actually both peer support groups and constant networking. Um, I, I learn a lot from networking conversations. Mm. And you mentioned earlier that a lot of that, is from the podcast itself, from the Smashing Plateau podcast and now from Going Solo. It is now, yes. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Now, do you have a favorite resource that you use a lot? Um, I, I really like the book, The One Thing mm -hmm. by Gary Keller. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a while since I've read that, but um, it's I, I recall it is a good book and it is very much about focus, isn't it? Uh, it, it's about focus and yeah, focus and focus. When you realize that 80% of our results come from 20% of our activity, the whole idea is how can you focus each day on the 20% that you believe will yield the 80% results? Hmm. Yeah. All right. What's the best way to keep a project on track? Accountability. Hmm. Um, to the peer group. Accountability, okay. right? Ac accountability. Mm. So if you, first of all, you need a plan. And if you write your plan down, you're more likely to actually do it than if it's in your head. If you tell it to one other person, you're forced to revisit what you did with that person at some point in the future, you're more likely to do it. And if you tell your plan to a group of people mm. and you're forced to revisit that discussion again at some point in the future with that peer group, you are more likely to perform. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's certainly true. And I'm, I'm having that experience at the moment. I've um, uh, entered a bike riding challenge this weekend, um, which is going to challenge me quite a bit and uh you know there were times when i was tempted to say oh, i'm not sure i'm ready for it or up for that but then i told a few people about it and so now i'm committed <laughs> there you go yeah. all right now what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves um ask somebody in your audience how they would differentiate you mm. i like that you'll be surprised 
Yeah, a lot of um, the conversation around this question is self awareness, and 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 we always end up um, coming to the conclusion that self awareness is actually quite challenging. So that that's a really great suggestion that um, getting other people's input on that. Okay, well, thanks for getting us through the buzz round, David. This has been really great. Now, where can people reach out and learn more about you and your work and even say thank you for what you've shared with us today? Um, sure, Jorgen. So the best place is to go to our website, smashingtheplateau.com. That's where both podcasts are housed. There's uh, information on how you can get in touch with me. And um, as you said, there are hundreds and hundreds of episodes of great content that you can listen to to your heart's content Mm. all right and we'll post that in the show notes so people can check those out Uh, there's certainly a lot of information there all right now what kind of parting advice would you like to leave our listener today particularly in the area of leadership and innovation um think about what your gifts are because every individual has gifts, every group has gifts. And when we share our gifts, the world prospers. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice, sharing the gifts. And, and, you know, by doing that, you make a difference to the world and that's motivating and keeps the energy up and, and the money flows as a result. Yes. And I, can I add one, one other sure. bit of liter- leadership advice? Um, which is, I don't know, particularly in America, people are looking for quick fixes and they're, they're looking for like, um, they, they, they talk about and think about breakthroughs and really um, aspire to achieve breakthroughs. The reality is if you study breakthroughs, they almost always occur after hundreds or thousands of mm. steps that nobody has seen. Yeah. So pay attention to your hundreds and thousands of steps and just do them consistently and frequently and and with some quality. Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, you demonstrated that very clearly with the podcast. You've been going for over 500 episodes with Smashing the Plateau. And and really, when pe- people now look at your success as a podcaster. It's not, it hasn't come overnight. Um, for sure not. Mm. All right, well, uh, finally, who would you like me to chat with on a future Nova Buzz podcast, and why? Uh, well, question. Yeah, my, <laughs> my my friend Jamie J, who is a fellow podcaster, hosts the podcast Culture Eats Strategy, and he also runs a great um, virtual assistant company called uh, Bottleneck Virtual Assistants. He's a he's a great guy, and he would be a great guest should he come on your show. Excellent. Well, we'll get, we'll get an introduction to Jamie from you and um, reach out to him and get him on the show. That would be wonderful. Thanks. And thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us today on the Innova Buzz podcast, David. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. It's been um, really fascinating to hear about how you've um, taken the Smashing the Plateau business and turned it into a podcast and the podcast contributing back to that business and how you've then launched the Going Solo podcast too as a result. I wish you um, had been around 14 years ago or whenever I was going through my my situation um, to provide those resources, but I'm sure there's lots of wonderful stuff there for people who are in business now and have been in business for a long time. I'm sure there's lessons there. I know certainly the Smashing the Plateau, the episodes I've listened to have been uh, really valuable with some insights each time. So, Thanks for coming on the Innova Buzz podcast. I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thanks so much, Jurgen. Thank you for inviting me. Bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed that engaging and informative conversation with David and took something away that you can put into action from what he shared with us in today's episode. What stood out for me was David's focus on peer groups and networking all through his work from podcasting to market research to client work and the value that he gets from those peer groups. I'd love to know what you took away from David's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash David Schreiner Khan. That is D-A-V-I-D S-H-R-E. I-N-E-R-C-A-H-N, all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash David Schreiner Khan. 
You'll also find contact information where you can get in touch with David and links to the Smashing the Plateau website, his podcasts, his social media pages and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. David suggested we have a conversation with Jamie J of Bottleneck Virtual Assistance and the Culture Eats Strategy podcast on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So Jamie, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast courtesy of David Schreiner Khan. Remember to check out our Marketing Master mini class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, it will enable you in less than 30 minutes to gain absolute clarity about who your ideal client is and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into Marketing Mastery, or our help with producing your very own podcast, even launching your very own podcast if you don't yet have one, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we can set up a quick call to have a short conversation and find out whether we're a good fit for one another. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got some more fantastic guests lined up including coach, writer and entrepreneur Kim Argett Singer and also Chris Yankolovsky of Remote Staff. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe I-N-N-O-V-A-B-U-Z-Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have, so go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating. Innovabiz.